We are, of course, extremely happy to be back in Prague, and we simply didn't miss a beat. What we left here in 2019, we simply picked up here again. Yeah, there was a lot of COVID in the meantime, but uh, also now you can see the, the clubs are coming back. We have, we have these meetings and a lot of clubs are here and they enjoy to be here. They want to talk to each other. We get to know each other better and better and better and this is a good thing. And also the situation with the IHF has changed dramatically to the positive side. Uh, they had a changement of the president, it's Luc Tardif now for René Fazel. René was an old-fashioned guy, he was uh, thinking we are the association of the associations. And now Luc is much more open, much more accepting for, for the stakeholders around the federations. And uh, we are on a positive way that we can work together, we are on a positive way for the recognition of the alliance. Maybe even a member of the IHF, I hope it will come. And uh, the two vice presidents, the executive, Peter Brija, uh, Hendrik Bach Nielsen, also, they, they are positive. We will have some discussions in the future, and I hope in the next two years we can be a member of the IHF. We need real influence. And the uh, power behind real influence comes from the fact that the clubs deliver the most important goods to the IHF tournaments, the Olympics, World Juniors, World Championships, players. This is the key. I see, and when I listen to what's actually happened, that the need for an organization like this is completely there because there are certain conflicts of interest all between different clubs, there are different things. And not only that, it's different between the different countries, but the clubs, the needs of the clubs. And I think one of the most appreciated things that I see is developing even more right now, and is that there is a cooperation between smaller and larger hockey nations. That clubs from such a wide assortment of countries where the status of hockey is so different Take the story that we heard about Belfast, for instance, the Belfast Giants yesterday, and take a comparison to something like Mr. Luther's Ezzy Ban. Back when they were formed, uh, I think the owners in the day uh, made a great decision uh, in the way that they didn't discriminate against race, religion, social class, gender, in a city that had a lot of segregation uh, after the peace pact. And I think that the, the community took to it. So, uh, you know, with the, uh, the island of Ireland only having one ice rink, and us now averaging almost four and a half thousand people a game. It's turning into a mainstream sport and it is because of that. It's a, it's a friendly environment. It's neutral in terms of colors. It's neutral in terms of religion. And we always give back to the community in any way we can. Did it happen that, let's say, a man who never knows about the ice hockey visit the, the game just, just to see what, what is, what is it, it, it is It is, yeah. So I, I'd like to think that we're turning into like a mainstream sport with a bit of culture. But early days, we embraced the circus. You know, that's kind of a, a, something we still kind of use as our theme. We want to make sure that whether you win, whether you lose, whether the person that comes to the game knows anything about the rules of hockey, mm -hmm. they have a great experience. So in between periods, we do sub cannons and we have all the shows that we can do to make it like an entertaining um, event for them. And then hopefully that will, that will bring them back again. The, the challenge we have is facilities. And that's the bottom line. Like it's hard for us to develop our own internal talent that come up into our into our team, and that's the cost-effective way of doing it. Uh, the junior giants have a couple hundred kids in their program, but for every game they play, they've got to go to Scotland for their game. So it's a ferry, mm -hmm. a bus, 24-hour trip, and back again for a 50-minute game. So they're very, very dedicated parents. But it makes it difficult because when these kids turn 16. They have decisions to make. Do I study at school? Do I play football? Do I continue on hockey and not have my weekends? Do I start going out on the weekends? So it, it's an absolute challenge on that. But for us, like we, we're, we're ultimately we, we're ran by a charity. Um, so we're very focused on the, the work we do in the community and making sure that we, we, we always do that, uh, irrelevant of like the number of people we have coming to our games. And we try to, we try to create the best possible experience we can. One of the key things to make hockey a large sport is actually creating interest from you, making players, kids doing the things. Because that is what I think, that's how also finds, if people can identify with the sport, you build a big fan base. Yeah, this is very special, what you mentioned, because the Alliance is focused on the pro party, mm -hmm. but you personally supported the youth development. Yes. So maybe it looks something strange. Why in pro hockey we should 
pay attention to the youth? Two reasons. Two reasons. There's two very big reasons. Number one, by creating interest and increasing the numbers of players in, from a young age, you automatically create a public interest. Your audience that wants to watch the game becomes larger. Every kid who goes in, they have parents, siblings, grandparents. You create a fan base. So to me, that in, an, in, in a sport that in many countries are not the size, I think you see that in, that's how it is in Sweden. I think that's probably how it is in the Czech Republic, for instance, or Slovakia or Finland. But that's how you create a fan base. So that's the reason, number one. Number two, we're talking a conglomerate, with maybe the exception of Germany, of small countries. But in most countries, we are a fairly small sport. And that, <coughs> or hockey is a very small sport. And that means that we have to make sure the more play, we, ha we have to walk on a, on a broader base, not having so much dropouts like you work with a pyramid and tryouts the whole time, which means that we need to secure a greater selection of, of players the further up in the pyramid and higher up towards the elite they come. That's for, that, so that's the two main reasons why it's so important. So there's one commercial reason, there's social reasons, but it also is, is a development reason for it. So that's the key reasons why we feel very strongly about supporting the youth hockey in terms of that. What is your next main goal? We are right now 90 members, or 91 actually, with the, our newest member, the Los Angeles Kings of the NHL, which is uh, a, a very good thing. But we said from the very beginning when we were founded in 2015, our big goal is 100 clubs. So we want to have 10 more clubs within the nearest future to break this magic number 100 clubs. Obviously, when you have a large membership, you need to serve those clubs. You need to answer the emails. You need to good, uh, do good things for them. But we are prepared for that challenge. So 100 clubs is our uh, next goal.